So it is turn 17 or possibly 18, and I have spent the entire day in bed with simulated flu symptoms thanks to the winter flu vaccine that I got. So I am feeling fucking terrible. And therefore I'm going to try and make this as quick as possible. Our blood hunters have continued blood hunting. We've had a couple of random events, they're not particularly interesting. And there's very little to say about what's happening on the world map, except that I am continuing my aforementioned plan. My site searches are continuing to march around and site search. I've not quite had enough money to build a lab here this turn, so I'm not actually going to bother. So I've set her to site search this turn. If I have the spare cash next turn, I'll build a lab here. Otherwise, I'm actually going to send this one to do the astral site searching so that this unit can stop wasting its time searching for the one astral sites and can use its much higher research value to research instead. So she'll march up here and then stay here while the rest continue to march on searching for sites. The slow consolidation of our troops into the capital so that we can arrange everybody to march northwards is, is ongoing, as is the similar consolidation of all of my wolf riders, because, you know, why not consolidate all of your monthly unit upkeeps into one easily repayable single army stack? There's one thing that I want to mention, which is that our research is, is going on fairly well. I have identified a second research goal that we're going to head for, which is Alteration 6. It's going to take us a long time to get there, but it has the incredibly useful spell Darkness, which renders the entire battlefield pitch black. This is going to be as detrimental for our giants as it is for their opponents. However, the spellcasters who are going to be summoning a lot of skeletons don't need to be able to see. Skeletons have spirit sight, which means that they don't need- that they can just see fine in the dark for the purposes of finding and killing the living. And my blood mages are going to spend a lot of si time summoning fiends of darkness. Be fighting in the dark is a pretty heavy penalty if you don't have dark vision, blind sight, spirit sight, any of these bonuses, which means that it's going to be a powerful combo if I can get that online, but that is a total of something like 6,300 research points it'll take to get from here to there. So I'm going to finish up a couple of these lower level research targets first. Construction is, a, is the next target because we're nearly there and that will give us the next level of magic items. Speaking of magic items, let's have a quick look at what we can actually manufacture at this point. So the magic item menu shows every every magic item in every path that the spellcaster you've selected has, including ones that are too high level for them to car uh, for them to manufacture. Which means we can see a lot of items here, even though we can't craft all of them. However, there are a lot of items that we have access to and could craft, but not on this particular individual. Skada has these. Well, I mean, all of my gigas have these three paths, which means that all of them will have access to the same set of items whether or not they can actually manufacture each of them. But for example, Short King has a much bigger list of items that he can make because he has so many more different types of magic accessible. We're not going to be manufacturing anything yet, and I will talk about what we will be making later, later on, because I want to go to bed. Well, 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 it's turn 18, and once again, there is almost nothing to talk about. Received another in-character message from Scalaria, who is basically just saying that he now considers an en considers us an enemy because we didn't help him against Nabar, but that won't be a problem right now, and it may not be a problem ever. We've gained one more magic site and a few more blood slaves. Other than that, we've had incredibly bad luck and uh, an event that destroys a huge amount of population and a temple has happened in our capital, which means we now have to rebuild that temple, which technically, if you think about it, means that in addition to the penalty of all of everything else, Effectively, that's a 400 gold and one temple check penalty this turn. This is why I don't like taking bad luck scaling, even though it's often necessary. So there's two interesting things as well. We've happened to have overseen a couple of battles elsewhere in the world. If you have a scout in a province where a battle takes place, but the scout remains hidden, then you get to see what the battle was between two other forces. This can be very useful if you want to keep track of what people's blesses are. Marion relies heavily on blessed sacred cavalry, so it's definitely worth checking what his bless is. As you can see, his Knights of the Chalice are now blessed. All Sacreds gain morale from being blessed, but he's also got a strong defensive buff with Shock Resistance, Fire Resistance, and Fate Weaving, which I believe negates the first hit they take in each battle. He's also got Awe, which makes them very hard to hit. You have to pass a morale check to attack them, and Blood Surge, which makes them do more damage the more things they kill. This is also interesting because this is Marignan clearly attacking Flegro. They are pushing into Flegro's territory and they have clearly actually started a war. So it's uh, definitely not not the time to be starting wars with your neighbours, judging by this guy's clear expertise. We've also overseen Pangaea taking an independent province, which means that we can get a look at their bless as well. Pangaea is an incredibly heavily focused nation on its sacreds. They tend to just win wars based solely on the abilities of their white centaurs. 
And so it is not surprising that this guy has clearly invested almost all of his points in an extensive bless. But because you get bless points based on the points you spend on magic paths, it doesn't necessarily mean his pretender will be weakened by spending these points elsewhere. It just means that he's chosen paths that allow him to have the bless he wants to have. As you can see, he's boosted his attack a lot with an attack boost and magic weapons, which means that they can hit things like ethereal units or magic units and so on much more easily. We've also got strong defenses with shock and fire resistance and a defense boost. And undying, which is an interesting bless effect. Undying plus six means that they effectively have a pool of six extra hit points after they hit zero hit points. They aren't actually killed until they hit minus six hit points. But if they go into that minus state, then at the end of the battle, they die automatically. It's also got regeneration, which is extremely useful, and a strength boost and a combat speed boost. So his centaurs are going to hit incredibly hard and incredibly fast, and gen just generally going to be something we don't want to deal with. There's a reason why Pangaea is one of the strongest nations in this era. Also, it might look like he took heavy losses, but I believe he gets these main ads for free, so it doesn't actually matter very much. I'm guessing that these are the kind of troops that you throw away in front to eat up a cavalry charge or a bunch of arrows. In terms of our actual orders, pretty much the same as last time, we're just consolidating our troops and preparing to go to war. Unfortunately, I have to spend 400 gold to rebuild that temple, which means we can't uh, improve our infrastructure any further this turn. But I'm probably going to give it one more turn of preparation before I send the wolf teams north to start scouting and begin positioning my troops in position. On that note, it is worth mentioning that at the end of last turn, Uruk sent me a message saying, hey, would you like it? Would you be interested in a non-aggression pact? I have not responded to that message because frankly, he bumped me out of this province and then never even mentioned it. And that's just such a kind of a, a sneaky, weaselly thing to do that I don't appreciate him. Aside from that, I've already declared NAPs with all of my other neighbours, which means that, you know, if I want to have any chance of actually seizing some territory in this game, I'm going to have to push into somebody. And he's kind of the best option right now, so the war will begin in a few turns. And that is everything I want to talk about this turn. Hello friends, it is turn 20 and we have one big thing to talk about today. Also, as you may have noticed, I'm almost at the time limit to get my turn in. I've been really slow the last couple of days as I have been both busy and also have had jaw pain from stupid dental problems that I can't get fixed. All of that aside, we've witnessed a couple more fights happening, but not any one that, any ones that are particularly interesting to us. It looks like Marion is having a relatively easy time absolutely destroying Flegra. And they seem also to be going to war with Ashdod at the same time, which is brave because a two-front war will often get you destroyed. We've had a very bad luck event. We've also had a fairly bad luck event. This is this is what happens when you take bad luck scaling. I kind of am tempted never to take it again. Taking a glance at the world map, we've got this lovely spiderwebby little diagram. So because I never responded to Uruk, I now suspect that he suspects that I, I'm planning to go to war with him. The thing is, I've left it pretty late in the game to have my first war. People are normally starting into conflicts, you know, five, four or five turns ago. Which means that the main utility of Skeleton Spam is starting to die off. It will no longer win, win battles all by itself, but it is still a very important component of winning battles. So I am possibly prematurely going to move my army out and get ready to head into Uruk territory. We've got two full teams of a wolf rider with 40 wolves who are preparing to sneak. They're going to be jumping, ready to get into his territory next turn. We're also moving our main army to here so that we can march into here. I might let that army stand here for one turn to, to harvest a few extra blood slaves, but we should be good. I tend to be overcautious in these games, which is why I haven't already launched into war. However, my previously recorded series, which I declared unfit for publication and is available as bonus material on my Patreon if you're interested, did end when I picked an early war I couldn't fight, so I think being cautious is understandable. So the main thing that I want to talk about is our scripting. If I show which units I've selected to move, we're moving a major chunk of our mage forces out, which will be a significant hit to our research. Also, side note, we've got two other wizards going off to do blood hunting. They're going to be harvesting from these provinces. But in short, I have two communion masters and four communion slaves, which should be plenty. Unfortunately, only one of those communion slaves will be a Skrati, so... Uh, the communion won't be quite as powerful as we would have wanted, since those guys are just enormous meat batteries for this sort of thing. We've also got our prophet, a spare general, and two other spare generals who are currently going to be doing the job of carting gems around for me. 
The AI will freely spend gems during combat in order to reduce the fatigue of spellcasting or increase their power level for one spell. So in order to have your mages not just piss all their gems up the wall at the start of combat, it's a common move to have scouts carrying gems who do not take part in the combat but will dole out handfuls of shiny precious magic juice at the end of every combat ready for the next one. I don't have a spare scout currently, however, I'm going to pick one up here. I'm just recruiting him this turn and have him move in at the same time so that it should all <laughs> work out. We'll get to my scripting in one moment, but let's take a quick look in here. There's an army of 30 Enkidu warriors here. I believe that he's this is a defensive army and he's not planning to actually start a war with it because... I'm, I'm confident that my forces would destroy it. Which might be hubris, but you never know. So let's take a look at that actual scripting. If I highlight the ones we're using, then in the scripting screen they are highlighted. I don't think I've ever talked about the scripting in detail before, so I'm just going to run through it all real quick right now. Commanders can be scripted with up to five specific actions that they will perform on the first five turns of combat. Troops can be given one general command that they will be that they will attempt to carry out over the course of the entire battle, and commanders also get a generalized command that will dictate their general behavior after their specific scripting runs out. Unit selection from the world map carries over to here so we can see which units we're intending to send. First off, this is very simple. I have an enormous blob of javeliners who are going to throw javelins. They should do a decent bit of damage. I've also got a front liner of axemen up in, up in front of them. It was supposed to be a much bigger line, but then I sought some advice and hit upon the idea of providing bodyguards to each of my communion guys, just in case. This means that as, as my units move across the battlefield, as these guys march forwards into combat, um, enough of them will be left behind to guard the commanders, while the critical mass of skeletons from our skeleton spam builds up. We've got three Gigias and a Skrati, who are... I guess it's Skratir? I don't know if Skrati is the plural... Doesn't matter, we're short on time. Their job is going to be to cast Sabbath Slave at the start of combat, thereby becoming batteries for the, the other mages to use. And we have two Death Mages who are scripted to cast Sabbath Master, making themselves masters of that um, communion. Interestingly, all communions contribute to the same com communion pool on your side of the battlefield. So if you're using the Astral uh, Communion Master spell or the Blood Sabbath Master spell, or I believe the Song Magic Choral Leader spell, that puts you in command of all of the communion slaves on the battlefield, re you know, regardless of how, which spell they cast as well. Then they'll be casting Personal Regeneration and Poison Resistance, which are self-targeted spells, spells that only affect the caster. But the benefit of a communion is that any spell directly and only affecting the caster is also passed on down to their communion slaves. Which means, of course, that these guys will then be both resistant to the poison attacks that Uruk might be using and also will be regenerating, which means that once they have run out of stamina to spend on the Master's spellcasting, they can freely spend their hit points. I've scripted them to cast these defensive spells and then start casting Horde of Skeletons. They're, they're, they can only be scripted for two additional steps, so that won't be a ton of Skeletons. However, one of the reasons why Skeleton Spam is so effective is that for some reason, the AI that can cast Death Spells really likes to cast Horde of Skeletons if it has the capacity to do so which means that you can reasonably rely on it to happen a lot during a combat. My my two horse commanders are literally just there to be spare commanders in the event that some terrible disaster accident happens and I lose my more important commanders, you know, so that there's still commanders on the battlefield and able to pick up troops after combat. They're also temporarily, temporarily carrying gems on behalf of the spellcasters. It should be noted that when I say gems, I also include blood slaves in that. They, I mean, mechanically, they, they are mostly gems. However, they do appear on the battlefield as battlefield units, which means that if you know what you're doing and your opponent is relying on blood, you can actually snipe out their blood slaves before they get spent to cast spells, which is interesting. They're the only gem type that has that effect because, again, they aren't gems, they're people. We are doing crimes here. It's, it's not you know, ambiguous. But basically their job is to just stand in the middle of the blob of troops and take command if someone more important dies. It must be emotionally upsetting to realise that you are merely a redundancy in someone else's plan. Then we of course have our two actual leaders, who are both priests and are both scripted to cast spells. Compensating for something is going to be casting smites, which will do some use. However, 
Um, Hrunia and Tjatsa are going to be casting generic spells. This is the generic battlefield order. If I click on here, you can see. They aren't scripted to do any specific actions. They only have their main order, which is cast spells. None of the spells they can cast at, as level one priests are useful to me because they can only class, cast a blessing and banishment. My opponents aren't going to be using undead or demons, so banishment is irrelevant, and I'm not using sacreds, so blessing is irrelevant. However, telling them to cast spells means that they will not move. Any creature that is scripted to do something and can't do that thing instead stands around doing nothing. So rather than have him do any of the other things that might result in him getting himself killed, cast standing and casting spells at the center of a big group of people is probably safer. So that's the scripting for my first actual combat. We won't see the results of that for a couple turns, since we're not actually going to reach combat for a couple turns, but it's good to do it now just in case... You know, it's not impossible he'll march his army over here, and if I have these guys unscripted, then the AI will just make random decisions for all of them in combat, which is bad. We're also running into a little bit of budgetary troubles, as you can see. We are only spending 608 per turn, but that is 608 on upkeep. That does not factor in the amount we are spending on recruiting new mages and troops. In fact, in order to start building yet another castle, I have... Oh, glad I noticed that. I have forgotten to tell these guys to search for sites. <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. And I have forgotten what I said, but say what I I have forgotten what I said, but I'm running out of time, so that's going to be all for today. Well, here we are on turn twenty-one, and for maybe the third time in a row, there's not a lot to say. We've done a bunch more site searching and been unlucky once again. We've overseen another battle, however, we don't really need to take a look at this one. This guy does have pretty good sacreds, but considering there's only two on the battlefield and no creatures that have the capacity to bless them. There's not really any point watching this to get insight to what the bless might be. We've also had another very bad luck event. In fact, these are so disproportionately bad, I'm seriously regretting taking the bad luck scaling. We also lost a scout, which is fine. That happens from time to time. We don't have any diplomacy with Ulm, but, uh, you know, patrollers discovering scouts and killing them isn't really considered a diplomatic issue anywhere because it's just a thing that happens. Assassins, on the other hand, or saboteurs, or seducers, or any of these kinds of things, those can cause an issue if your opponent finds them. And by opponent, I mean people who are currently your allies, but that you are thinking about uh, going to war with later on. So our orders are pretty simple, and our geopolitical situation is identical. Except that this turn, we are actually going to make a hostile move against Uruk. We're moving our main army into this province. We're having our scouts also take this province. I hope to have these scouts sneaking around a few turns before going to war, but I think he suspects I'm going to war any moment, and I don't want him to get the first move, so I'm just going to head straight in now. According to my unofficial mentor, shall we say, I've left it quite late to go to war, and I have probably over-prepared, but you never know, who knows what's going to happen, so we are going to have to try and make this work. Incidentally, sneaking a bunch of hidden units into your opponent's territory to seize a bunch of provinces on the first turn of active war is a tactic known as elfing, because the elven nations have a lot of uh, very hidden units that tend to do that. And we do know that his provinces are not massively heavily defended, because our scouts have been sneaking around for a few turns, and pretty much everywhere is listed as well-organised. This is the category between, I believe, 6 points and 19 points of province defence, so most people just put 6 in and leave it there so that your opponent doesn't know where you might have put more points elsewhere. However, if Uruk is smart, they will probably have put a bunch of extra province defence in this province, since it's the one we bumped earlier, and of these two provinces, there's more of an incentive for Jotunheim to take a forest than a cave. Mage recruitment continues apace in all of our mage recruitment places. Site searching remains... Broadly unlucky for us, but, you know, got to keep doing it. In terms of recruitment, in the capital, we're continuing to recruit Scratty, and we've switched over to Godi Huskals for the reinforcement forces that will be moving north to join the main army later. Those guys are like extra strong upgraded javeliners. We've also got a couple bloodhunters starting to bloodhunt, and that's really it. Except for one thing, which is that, again, on the advice of my mentor, I have slightly changed the battle layout. I have switched from having two communion masters to four communion slaves to having four masters and two slaves. I'm slightly uncomfortable with this because I'm worried that the uh, weaker of the two slaves is just going to die from, from fatigue damage, but, you know, the battle probably won't last long enough that it's going to be an issue. And in a few turns, we'll probably have some spare Scrati joining communions anyway. So that really is everything we need to talk about this turn. Wait, scratch that. I've also decided to start upgrading this fortress here for obvious reasons, since it's our, by far our most valuable province. And that really is everything we need to talk about this turn. 
If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe and share. I also stream regularly on Twitch, and you can find me on Twitter for updates and announcements. If you want to contribute to my continued existence, then why not donate to me on Ko-fi or Patreon? All of the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching.